Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are so glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight we hope to return to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we're back to our study of the book of Numbers within that larger study. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 21. We'll be there in just a few moments. But as always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we're back to the book of Numbers, and tonight we want to take a look at Numbers chapter 21, and I believe our study should be somewhat shorter tonight because unlike most studies in this series, tonight we're only covering one chapter. And the reason is the next four chapters pretty much go together after this. So in Numbers 22, 23, 24, 25, we've got a chunk of the book that deals with the prophecy of Balaam. And I'm hoping to be out of town for the next several weeks, so I hesitate to jump into Balaam just a little bit before that and then take several weeks off. So tonight we're just going to be looking at Numbers 21. It really does stand on its own. It doesn't really go with the chapter before it or the ones after it. So let's just jump right into it tonight by looking at Numbers 21 verses 1 through 5. This is the first paragraph. Numbers 21 verses 1 through 5. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, then he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. The Lord heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. Then they utterly destroyed them in their cities. Thus the name of this place was called Hormah. Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. At this point, the Israelites are coming up toward the Promised Land from the south, and as they're on their way north, this Canaanite king from the Negev, the desert region south of Israel, hears about it. And he goes out to fight, and he takes some captive in the process. However, notice the nation of Israel makes a vow that with God's help, they're going to wipe these people off the face of this earth. And God agrees with that, and the people kill off their attackers. Well, as they continue, they're getting ready to go around the land of Edom, and the people start getting in the mood for some complaining. So... They haven't done that maybe for a little bit, and so it's time. Uh, this seems to be a regular thing through the years, on and off for the past 40 years, but the people suggest that God and Moses have conspired together to bring them out of Egypt for the purpose of killing them in the wilderness. And uh, we've seen this before. The actual complaint is pretty interesting. They complain that they have no food and water and that they hate the food. Okay, we need to think about that just for a second now, don't we? Um, do they have food or do they not have food? Well, they do have food, but it's not the kind of food that they want. And so they complain that they have no food. They almost sound like little children, don't they? Um, I'm starving. Uh, I have no food when, in fact, um, you have food. It's just not the food that you want. And as you can imagine, God is not happy about this. God is extremely upset. So let's continue with Numbers 21, verses 6 through 9. The next paragraph, Numbers 21, 6 through 9. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord, that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, and set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Well, this hasn't ever happened before. The people keep whining and complaining. That's familiar. Uh, again, this has gone on for 40 years now, and so God tries a new approach. He tries something completely different. And that is he sends fiery serpents or snakes uh, in to bite people. And uh, fiery serpents, just that reference there, if you want to look into that, uh, go ahead. But uh, some of the commentaries 
had mentioned some of those legends of fire-breathing dragons. And uh, we talked about dragons and dinosaurs and that kind of thing in a sermon a while back. So uh, it just uh, make that note here. It's an interesting reference. So what were these things? We don't really know. They were fiery serpents. As I understand it, uh, most people, though, get bitten by snakes pretty rarely. It doesn't happen all the time. Uh, before hiking in the Smoky Mountains a few years ago, Aaron, one of our elders, explained to me that most snake bites happen when people are hiking and they step over a log and that snakes like to hide under logs and they're prepared pretty much to strike anything that comes down in front of that log hoping it's a mouse <laughs> or something they can eat. Um, however, when we're hiking and we step over a log, we inadvertently step into that kill zone and even though the snake is probably not capable of eating us, they will strike because we got in the zone, so to speak. And so Aaron's advice then was just to be very careful when stepping over roots and logs, especially when going downhill and when we can't see what's under that log. But even there, getting bitten by a snake is pretty rare. However, here in Numbers 21, people are not getting bitten when they're out on a hike, are they? <laughs> Uh, these serpents are spreading throughout the camp and they are actively attacking people. These snakes, these serpents, these fiery serpents are chasing people down. And so this is extremely unusual behavior. People are dying. In fact, it's so bad. It's, it's obvious that God is causing this to happen. This is supernatural. Uh, they didn't just happen to wander into some snake pit in the middle of nowhere, but this has never happened before. And so I want us to note that even without a lecture from Moses, the people realize God is punishing us for our whining. And that's a pretty wise realization on their part. And so they cry out to Moses, they confess, we have sinned uh, because we have spoken against the Lord and you. And I think that right there is a pretty good first step when we sin, uh, either when we sin against God or when we sin against another human being. We confess that what we've done is wrong. And that right there is a pretty big hurdle for a lot of people just saying, I was wrong, but we aren't to cover up for it. We aren't to try to deflect blame. We aren't to blame it on somebody else, but we are simply to admit we have sinned. And so in that regard, uh, these guys set a pretty good example for us. Well, their next move after confessing that what they've done is a sin uh, they ask Moses to intercede. And again, this is what Moses does. He is an intercessor. He stands between God and the people. He's a prophet. We know that from other passages. He is, uh, he's got a direct hotline to God. That's the way I think of it in my mind anyway. Uh, kind of the lines of communication are open. God then tells Moses to make what is pretty much a statue, uh, the image of a snake. He is to make this out of bronze and he is to mount it up on a pole so that everybody can see it. This is to be the ultimate visual aid. It will literally aid them or heal them whenever they look at it. And they do have to look at it. There is something they actually have to do. They have to, if they're bitten by a snake, word gets out that they know what to do. And so they actually have to physically use their neck muscles and turn their eyes toward this snake on a pole, this bronze serpent, and they are to look at it in order to be healed. And that's what they do. If they were bitten by a snake, they look at that bronze serpent and they live. Now, most of us uh, participating in tonight's class probably realized that they uh, saved the bronze serpent after this event, didn't they? Uh, it did its job, but somebody packed it away. They took it along as they eventually settled down into the promised land. And I mention this because as the years go by, the people start to actually worship the bronze serpent. So since we have a few extra minutes tonight, I want us to uh, notice this. And since this applies to what we've just read, I want to include the reference here. This is 2 Kings 18, 1 through 6. This is roughly 700 years later. And now imagine that. It's hard for us to picture 700 years. Our country hasn't been around for 700 years. And so 700 years in the past, they had this incident in the wilderness, and here they are. And I'm going to be reading from 2 Kings 18, 1 through 6. Now it came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. 
He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord, he did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. So somebody apparently saves the bronze serpent. It had already served its purpose. It did what it was intended to do, but it's a pretty cool piece of history. And, you know, plus maybe it saved us once, maybe it'll come in handy again if we get attacked by a bunch of flaming snakes. Um, let's just kind of tuck this away just in case. And so for whatever reason, they save it. But over time, they start to worship it. They're actually burning incense to it as if it is a god. But nevertheless, when Hezekiah takes over as king, he is 25 years old. And whenever I hear an age like that in the Bible, I try to think of people I know who are roughly that age. So if you think of somebody in your life you know who's 25, we have some young adults at church who are kind of in their mid to late 20s, maybe early 30s. So somewhere in that range, 25 years old, uh, he takes over the kingship. And as soon as he takes the throne, he starts making some very good decisions. He starts making some reforms. And in the process of bringing the people back to God, he notices this thing is bad. And so he takes this bronze serpent and he breaks it into pieces, among other things. And God is very pleased with that. So finally, somebody has the courage to pretty much say, this is wrong, and actually do something about it. And he was a very uh, relatively young man when he does that. But we've read this passage because the serpent was first made by Moses at God's direction back here in Numbers chapter 21 where we are tonight. So it's kind of neat how the Bible fits together like that over hundreds of years. Well, not only do we read about the bronze serpent many years later in 2 Kings, but we also have several significant references in the New Testament. In John chapter 3, for example, Jesus is having a discussion with Nicodemus, the Jewish religious leader. And in that discussion, Jesus says in John 3, 14 and 15, as Moses lifted up the servant serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him uh, will in him have eternal life. So Jesus then uses that bronze servant, uh, serpent as a picture, as an illustration, kind of a precursor of him being lifted up on the cross. So it's important we know this story. If we had no idea who Moses was or what happened here in Numbers 21, that reference really wouldn't make as much sense as it does. Well, Jesus repeats this in John 8, 28, where he says, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. So just a very brief passing reference, but it does seem to be connected. And that picture comes up again in John 12, 33 through 36. That's where Jesus says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever, and how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. So another kind of brief passing reference there that I think Numbers 21 helps us understand. But there's at least one more reference in the New Testament where Paul is using the wilderness wanderings to try to teach some lessons. And he says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 9, Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. So we've got several references then to the serpents and uh, the bronze serpent in the New Testament. So I think, again, there's a value to us uh, kind of going back to the source tonight so that we can really understand those. Well, let's continue with Numbers 21, verses uh, 10 through 15. Got the reference wrong. Sorry about that. But uh, 10 through 15 is where we are. Numbers 21, 10 through 15. Now the sons of Israel moved out and camped in Oboth. They journeyed from Oboth and camped at I Abaram, in the wilderness which is opposite Moab to the east. From there they set out and camped in Wadi Zered. From there they journeyed and camped on the other side of the Arnon, which is in the wilderness that comes out of the border of the Amorites. For the Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. Therefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Waheb 
in Supa and the wadis of the Arnon and the slope of the wadis that extends to the site of Ar and leads to the border of Moab. Well, Moses is just noting here that the people are continuing to move closer to the promised land. This is their mission. And this is not make-believe. This is not a fairy tale. These are real places. And so the people who read this for the first time would have been familiar with these locations. And even now, uh, we can still figure out some of these where they were. In verse 14, we've got an interesting reference to a book that we apparently no longer have, the Book of the Wars of the Lord. It appears to maybe be a songbook that they used recording some of their battles. And, you know, from time to time we'll find references in Scripture like this. And, and I don't think we need to be disturbed that we're missing out on anything, that we don't have the Book of the Wars of the Lord. Uh, but we do have what we need to know in the Book of Numbers. But this reference indicates that uh, other people were taking notes on all of this. And uh, the quote in verses 14 and 15 seems to be taken from this other source that we no longer have. A wadi, by the way, we should point this out, is basically a seasonal creek bed. I think that's the way I would summarize it. It would dry up in the dry season, but it would be subject to flash flooding in the rainy season. And there were many of these in that part of the world. Without maps like we have today, they, they would kind of describe locations in terms of cities and elevations and, uh, you know, bodies of water and wadis and rivers and creeks. And that's pretty much what we see here. All right, let's continue with the next section, Numbers 21, verses 16 through 20. Numbers 21, 16 through 20. From there, they continue to Beer, that is, the well where the Lord said to Moses, Assemble the people that I may give them water. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing to it, the well which the leaders sank, which the nobles of the people dug with the scepter and with their staffs. And from the wilderness, they continued to Matana. And from Matana to Nahilal, to Nahilal, to Bamoth, and from Bamoth to the valley that is in the land of Moab at the top of Pisgah, which overlooks the wasteland. So there's a place called Beer in the Bible. This is one of those places where God had Moses get water from a well. And it's interesting, it was so significant that they write a song about it. Water was a huge deal, of course, and we've seen this through the years. Uh, but this time they actually had to dig to get to it. And I didn't remember reading about this before. I know I have. Uh, but instead of speaking to a rock or striking a rock, as in times past, this time the people had to actually do some digging. And the nobles, the leaders get involved. They do some digging. They get their hands dirty using sept the scepter uh, and their staff. So this was a team effort, we might say. And at the end of this passage, they keep moving until they get to the land of Moab. Moab is basically the territory uh, directly east of the Dead Sea. So they're getting a lot closer. Well, let's continue with Numbers 21, verses 21 through 26. Numbers 21, 21 through 26. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We will not turn off into field or vineyard. We will not drink water from wells. We will go by the king's highway until we have passed through your border. But Sihon would not permit Israel to pass through his border. So Sihon gathered all his people and went out against Israel in the wilderness and came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. Then Israel struck him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok, as far as the sons of Ammon. For the border of the sons of Ammon was Jazer. Israel took all these cities, and Israel lived in all the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon and in all her villages. For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and had taken all his land out of his hand as far as the Arnon. As they continue moving further north, they send messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites. If you remember, we studied this this past Sunday. Uh, part of the law of Moses was that before they attack anywhere, they had to uh, send messengers, extending terms of peace, trying to work something out. And so just as they had done to the Edomites in this passage, uh, that passage we studied last week, uh, they make the same offer. Let us pass through your land. We won't touch anything. We're not going to drink your water, eat your food. We're just going to stay on the highway and keep moving. Well, that's a reasonable thing, uh, but Sihon, though, objects. And not only does he object, he attacks, and the attack does not go well for him. In fact, uh, not only does Israel defeat Sihon and his people in battle, they also kill everybody, and they take his land. And we should just note here, it didn't have to be this way. Israel had no real intention of taking this man's land. Um, that was not their plan. All they wanted to do was to pass through. But due to Sihon's stubbornness, he and his people are completely exterminated. And again, it did not have to be that way. 
Well, let's continue with numbers 21, 27 through 31. And here we have what seems to be a song of uh, celebrating their victory. We don't have a lot of uh, rhyme and rhythm here in English. I'm assuming that in Hebrew there would have been some pattern. And I think we can see in most translations it's set aside in verse format, uh, like a poem or a song. So uh, Numbers 21, 27 through 31. Therefore, those who use Proverbs say, Come to Heshbon, uh, let it be built, so the city of Sihon be established. So let the city of Sihon be established. For a fire went forth from Heshbon, a flame from the town of Sihon. It devoured Ar of Moab, the dominant heights of the Arnon. Woe to you, O Moab! You are ruined, O people of Chemosh. He has given his sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity to an Amorite king, Sihon. But we have cast them down. Heshbon is ruined as far as Dibon. Then we have laid waste even to Nophah, which reaches to Mediba. Thus Israel lived in the land of the Amorites. Moses sent to spy out Jazer, and they captured its villages and dispossessed the Amorites who were there. As we touched on in the previous paragraph, Sihon took the city of Heshbon from the Moabites, but now Israel has taken land from all of them. So Israel then uh, takes over some territory that we, they really weren't expecting to conquer simply due to the stubbornness of some of those surrounding rulers, the people who were standing between them and the promised land. They had to get where they were going. And because the, the locals would not cooperate, God's people had to take that land by force and they won. And in verse 31, they continue moving north. Uh, taking some more land from the Amorites who were just north of there. So let's conclude tonight with Numbers 21, verses 33 through 35. Numbers 21, 33 through 35. Then they turned and went up by the way of Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, went out with all his people for battle at Edri. But the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand and all his people and his land, and you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. So they killed him and his sons and all his people, until there was no remnant left him, and they possessed his land. So as the Israelites continue moving, they come to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, comes out ready for battle. And bad move on his part, just like the others, Og is also defeated. And this time we have a little bit more from God. God communicates with Moses, giving him the go-ahead on this one, along with some encouragement. And the result is the Israelites completely annihilate Og and his people, leaving no trace of them at all. And then they take his land away. And again, obviously they didn't go looking for this. This is not their mission. But Ah got in the way, and he paid the price. By the way, if you were with us this past Sunday, the names Sihon and Og might be a little more familiar to us than they might have been otherwise. Uh, if you remember, when the messengers came to Jericho to meet up with Rahab, she says, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. That's Joshua 2, verses 9 through 11. The people of Jericho, therefore, were very familiar with what had been happening out here in the wilderness. These people are getting closer, and they knew that the Israelites were killing everybody in their path, and they are completely, utterly terrified um, that they are now camped right across the Jordan River. So I just think it's interesting how that overlaps. So this brings us to the end of Numbers 21. Next week, hopefully, um, I plan on being out of town. That's the idea. <laughs> And I'll be out for the next three Wednesdays, so we're going to be having some guest speakers, so to speak, and uh, we are not able to stream somebody's material who's, that's not ours on YouTube. Uh, YouTube doesn't allow that, uh, but I'll share the links by email to our members and to those who signed up to be notified concerning our live streams. And I'll also share these in the private live stream group on Facebook. I'll also try to share these on our public Facebook page as well. And so I'm just saying, if you only get notified of our Wednesday class through YouTube itself, if YouTube is the only way that you're connected to us and those notifications come through YouTube itself, let me know. 
and I'll be glad to make sure you get the link to whatever we're going to be looking at over the next three weeks. I hope to attend the Bear Valley Bible Lectures out in Denver and then continue on uh, to see my sister out past Seattle. Um, as always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. If there's something we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can help or encourage you, uh, we want to invite you to reach out, get in touch with us, send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also uh, call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight for being a God who is willing to go to war in protecting your people from spiritual danger. We're thankful for this record of the Israelites and the time that they spent in the wilderness, and we pray that we would learn from their example. We want to learn from both the good and the bad. We pray that you will keep us from complaining, but we pray that you would help us to step out in faith as we should. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We do love you, and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.